Now, before I go to the word of the Lord, I want to talk about something. See, because as you know, or you don't know me, I've always believed that very strongly in the scripture, wisdom cries out in the streets. Wisdom cries out in the streets. And one of the ways that I believe that that fulfills itself is in current events. And what happens day by day, if you listen, wisdom's crying out through it, okay? So I want to acknowledge the death of Hugh Hefner, who some people might know who that is, some people don't. But let me put it this way. In post-World War II America was basically a Judeo-Christian ethic that ruled. And for the most part, other than in select areas, you didn't have to lock your door. Your kids ran around late at night. You didn't worry about them being enslaved and abducted. And you, you just didn't have that kind of thing, okay? And pornography definitely was against the law. And uh, one of the heroes of Satan uh, is Hugh Hefner, who created this magazine that he's going to be celebrated now by the beautiful people. Uh, they love him, but, but he's Satan's son. And basically he broke down that sexual wall of Judeo-Christian ethics. He created Playboy magazine, which probably sent untold millions of people to hell. I kid you not. See, this, this is one of the problems, okay? Back before him, I mean, fornication was something you were ashamed of. If you got pregnant out of wedlock, good heavens. Parents would send you away somewhere to have the baby or something. I don't know if I agree with the way they handled that, but the, Hef, what Hefner was asked one time, what's, what's a legacy of your life you want to be remembered for? He said, I took away the shame of premarital sex, okay? Now, look, you flash forward after his effect. Everyone's got to lock their doors. You have a th thriving trafficking in sex slaves, okay? I mean, people think, you know, well, slavery, that's a long time ago. No, slavery's now. There's more slavery now than there was at the peak of the Civil War. People are being trafficked from country to country because once you break down the, the, the Judeo-Christian ethic, Okay, anything's possible, okay? And it's not even just mature people being slaves. It's children's <laughs> pedophilia, okay? And what happens is that God erects walls for people. God puts up boundaries to save people, to keep people, to keep them sane. Not committing fornication doesn't mean that you're going to go to heaven. Having a Christian sexual ethic is not salvation, but uh, abandoning one will ensure that you'll go to hell. And millions have gone to hell. And one of the legacies is that fornication is not that big a deal anymore in people's minds. And the ironic thing is, that's good, partly because of Hugh Hefner, but the ironic thing is, it's still every bit as big a deal with God as it ever was. He hasn't changed, okay? He'll never change. He'll always hate sexual sin. In fact, the Bible says sexual sin is not like any other sin. Sexual sin goes directly to the core of who you are as a person. You cannot do it and be the same. You cannot do it and be uncorrupted. You cannot do it without destroying yourself, okay? And this uh, evil, evil man, and here's another problem I have. Uh, Christians often, I'm not saying you do it, but other, other, in other circles, Correct me. Well, you should, you're supposed to love, you know, the, the sinner and hate the sin. Well, there's another Bible verse that says, Are you going to love those that hate the Lord? Are you going to love those that hate the Lord? <laughs> Look, part of our moral capacity of a healthy spirituality is equal measures of love and hate. You know the problem with this generation? No hate. We've been listening to the Beatles for so long, we don't even hate anything. All you need is love. Well, all you need is hate, too. You should hate evil. You should hate the cause of evil people. Now, I hate Hugh Hefner, although I never wished that he'd go to hell. If I found out he's in heaven right now, I'd be the biggest shouter, hallelujah, because I deserve to go to hell too, and so does he. 
but I am unambiguous about my utter and absolute hatred of his cause, of everything he's done, everything he stands for, the damage he's done to people's families, lives, the untold countless divorces because of him, the ruined innocence of little kids. You know most pornography found its way into the hands of little boys 10 years old and under? <laughs> How are you ever going to be the same after you see that? Now you look at the America that we have now. If you look back in the America of the post-World War II, and look at the America now, after all those walls have been torn down, pornography is common. No shame whatsoever with fornication. We've got a bunch of freaks running around as a direct consequence of this. You can't even keep your sanity if you throw away these things. People are losing their minds. You got such confusion. Now it's on the level of gender. Do you think in 1946 anyone would ever have dreamed that we'd have a president like the last president advocating for genderless bathrooms? And are you out of your? <laughs> you gotta hate evil if you love the Lord. I don't mean personal hatred. If I could do good to anybody, if I could do good to Barack Obama, if I could do good to Hugh Hefner while he's alive, if I could do good to Osama bin Laden, believe me, I, I, would, I would hope that I would do it. But I'd hope that I'd never have anything but an absolute hatred for everything they stand for. Modern Christians are really good on love because that's all that's been preached for 70 years. Because love is so thick, it's so sweet, it's so saccharine, you can't hardly stand it. What about hate? What about indignation against evil? What about utter hatred of stuff like pornography? Some people can never get free of their sins because they don't hate them. If you don't hate your sins, you won't be free. Some people are torn between pornography and God. Well, look, this isn't new. You go back in the Old Testament. Why do you think they kept going back to Baal? Why do you think they kept going back to Ashtoreth? You think it was for religious reasons? The worship of Baal and Ashtoreth was saturated with sexual sin. So they're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And they were constantly being defeated. Eventually they were utterly enslaved. Because they never broke away from Baal and Ashtoreth. Well, Hugh Hefner and his ilk are the modern incarnations of Baal and Ashtaroth. They're perverted, and they have led this nation astray. They have corrupted it to the core. Good riddance to this evil man. By the way, God gave him 91 years to repent. Some say, well, he might have repented. Man did that kind of damage and repented. He owes it to everybody to tell us. Right? Is it just all private? <laughs> he destroyed. <laughs> now there's a lot of willing participants with him. But he put it out there. He tore down the walls. There's a lot of people that wouldn't do things just because there's shame with it. Shame is a powerful thing. To remove it is a powerful thing. There are many people who stuck it out in marriages they weren't happy in because they were ashamed. Divorce used to have a stigma. And then they found out if you just stick it out, sooner or later you might find out you love each other again. You can learn to love the one you're with. Amen? But once you tear down those walls and make it possible, like God said that the building the Tower of Babel, if they can imagine it, it's possible. These girls that got pregnant and they would have kept their baby even though it was inconvenient and shameful to them. And they might have found out how much they loved that baby. But no, modern people like Hefner was a leader in this. Abortion. Once it's possible, then the pressure is on the people. I'm telling you, we are living in Babylon itself. And judgment is coming to this country. And every single day that we have without judgment is grace and mercy. And the other thing is, you know, get a clue. Hate evil. You know what the Bible says? You that love the Lord hate evil. God commands it. 
Now, I don't hate any personal person. I don't personally get insulted. I'm willing to turn the other cheek if someone personally... This isn't personal. This has to do with loyalty. Loyalty to God. If you love God, then you hate those that hate God, and you love those that love God. Now, Jesus said, love your enemy. Exactly. I do. It's possible to hate someone and love them at the same time. Well, how is that? David said in Psalm 139, don't I hate those that hate you with a perfect hatred? Listen, folks, this is a very important thing. It has to do with your own moral life. If you do not have the capacity for indignation that's valid, then you are crippled morally. Okay. How do you hate someone and love them at the same time? I hate everything they stand for. I hate every cause that they promote. I hate the damage they are doing by their evil and the influence they have on others. But I don't wish a mill. You can pray for them that they'll go get saved. Look, the worst king of Judah got saved. He, br- he drug idols into the very temple of God. He brought Baal and Ashtoreth into the temple of God. He, he introduced something even uh, on the same level of abortion, Moloch worship, into Judah, the last place on earth where there's a true religion. He corrupted it so bad. He was one of the worst. He was the worst. He was so bad that here's what happened. The king, took, the king of Babylon took him into slavery. And while he's there in prison, he'll kneel down on, his, on the prison cell and he confessed his sins to the Lord. That's all the Bible says. And the Lord forgave him. King Manasseh. But his effect was so great that though the Lord forgave him, It became not a matter of if, but when the judgment was going to fall on Judah. Okay. So I don't know what happened to Hugh Hefner. But I know what his effect was. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's not people here that have had episodes of their life badly damaged by this wicked man. It's just astonishing to me. Uh, the people that love and call evil good and then turn right around and call good evil. And if you promote libertinism and freedom from all restraint, then the people think you're a champion. But if you dare to raise your voice for the original, then you're a hater. Is that not right? That's right. Are you ready? Because I'm telling you, there's going to come a persecution madness. See, the same people praising Hefner now, because they celebrate. They actually, there's people that actually think America's progressed. Okay? That we're at the zenith right now. Part of the reason is the education's so abhorrent that every day is the year zero for people. They don't know what happened in the past. They have no idea. It's just bad. All they know is it's bad. Nothing good, all bad. That's why you got these clowns desecrating the flag. Okay, because everything's bad. Only the future, that's good. There's actually people think we're at the zenith now, when really we've never been lower and closer to a terrible judgment. Only time worse is the Civil War when we got judged for slavery. We are in bad shape, let me tell you. Well, anyway, one, one of the things we're going to have to do, <laughs> I keep trying to go to the scripture, I promise you. One of the things you're going to have to do is figure out what side you're on. Okay. Now, there's not two human sides as far as I'm concerned. There's, there's a side of humanity and there's the side of God. You've got to get on God's side, not man's. Uh, the, the, last, the last battle for us, which will be so severe, and it's already raging, is a battle between choosing between good and good. Okay. The do-gooders, the social justice warriors, the champions of gay rights and civil rights and all this other stuff, 
It's all so good for you to take a stand for God. It's, it makes you a hater automatically. And if you care one bit what godless people actually think about you, then you're already defeated. You cannot, you, Jesus said, don't fear the one that has the power to hurt you. Even if they could kill you, don't fear them. Fear the one that has power to go take it further, you cast body and soul into hell. And remember this, fear is not just craving fear. Fear is regard. Who do you regard? Who do you live for? What audience are you playing your life out for? Is it for man or for the Father who sees in secret? God sees everything, and everyone here that's Christian, you have a secret life before him. You have a secret life before him. You have things in your life that you've done unto him, dealings you've had with him that no one else will ever know about, but he knows. He sees. And cultivate that secret life and fear God, and we will get through anything. We do not need to be afraid. But if you don't fear God, then all you have left is a fear of man, right? He says, don't fear the one that has the power to hurt the body. Fear the one who has the power to cast body and soul into hell. Fear him, my friends. That's what Jesus said. But I'm so glad for the next verse, because that sounds gruesome on itself. But the next verse says... Aren't two farthings sold for a penny? How much are birds going for here in Marion? Anyone know? Anyone bought any sparrows lately? You guys don't make sparrow pie? <laughs> we might be reduced to that someday. <laughs> and yet not one sparrow could fall out of a tree without God seeing and caring. And then Jesus said to you and to me, hey, you're worth more than many sparrows. Look, Jesus sees your situation. He cares. You're not oblivious to him. He knows what's going on. He says all the good and all the bad. That's another thing too, you know. Jesus said, be careful of hypocrisy because there's nothing hidden that won't be revealed. So notice what he says, the hypocrisy is short, short-sighted. Okay. Sooner or later, everything, uh, you know, the, the jig's up. Everything's known for what it really is. So the best policy is just to be real now. Right? <laughs> no play acting. Amen? We're done. No hypocrisy. I'm going to be who I am. Nothing more, nothing less. I'm going to play to God, not man. Okay? And I'm going to take God's side in every conflict. I'm going to go with the word of God, not with popular sentiment. And that's my mini-sermon for the day.